Hello everybody and welcome to another lecture of CS202. Today being a special bonus one since tomorrow, that is exactly in 24 hours from now if you're watching live, you have your second exam. And so today's focus of the lecture is going to be to review for said exam. So here's the game plan for the lecture today. I'm going to go over the exam layout and by that I am talking about the question topics and how many questions per topic. Then I'm going to kind of give you an overview of all of the questions. I'm not going to tell you what the question is, but I'll tell you what like the general consensus of each question is. And uh, again, it's just like the last test. So each section has like maybe 30 questions and you're only going to get two or three questions out of that pool. So each person's test is going to be unique. And that is, of course, to prevent cheating and other kind of suspicious activity, but also to make, you know, to, to have a, a random assortment of questions that everybody contributed, all of the instructors this semester for 202. Anyways, once I take care of that, which should be maybe about 20 minutes, then I am going to open up the floor for questions for those of you that are watching live. I did get three requests uh, before the lecture, people that are not watching live, but they said that, uh, you know, if I have time, I could do I could go over one of those and they'll watch the recording later. Those three topics, one of them asked for an example of an operator overloading using a friend function. And then the other two were sort of generic requests asking for virtuals and linked lists. So what we'll do is we'll see if anybody has any questions that is currently watching. And then when we run out of those, then I'll go over those unless nobody has questions live. OK, but uh, I hope you guys are excited for this as I am to see how you guys do. So I am not going to show you, but I am looking here at the second exam. So don't try to do any like enhance on my eyeglass reflection of the test. But so let me uh, let me give you the basics of the exam. First of all, the, the exam is is worth 20 points. So you're going to like it is worth 20 points. But that is just the point distribution of the exam. But like. The exam is still worth whatever the syllabus said, which I think is like 15% here. I'm going to open the syllabus really fast to see what it's supposed to be worth. Let's see. We got exams. There will be two midterm exams worth 15% each. So whatever the point distribution is in the exam itself doesn't matter because it's worth 15% of your grade. That is, of course, the difference between an A and a B or a B and a C and vice versa. So... It's, uh, it's important that we, that we take it seriously, but at the same time, it's only 50%, so it's not going to like destroy everything as long as you at least do decent on it, I would say. So, okay, 20 points. Uh, the time is going to be the same as before, so it's going to be basically from 1 to 2.15 on Tuesday. That's again 24 hours from now, a little bit less now. However, you are getting 100 minutes. So that allows you for any potential uh, glitches or uploading time if you decide to do something by hand or anything like that. Um, so the unlock time is at 12.50 actually, and the lock time is at 2.32. Uh, that, that means that if you want to start out 10 minutes early, you technically can, and you have those extra minutes if something goes wrong. You can, of course, use the whole time if you want, but the idea being that the test should be doable between 1 and 2.15, as long as everything goes smooth with that internet and whatnot. Okay, so that's the overview, and uh, if I go ahead and look at the way that I, I did the exam is, we, again, we did a bunch of question pools, and I'm going to give you the topics of the question pools and how many questions are going to be taken out of the pool. So first, the first thing you have in the test is the same as before, where you got like the, you know, the rules and regulations of the test and whatnot. The test is open notes and open, open, I guess, IDE or computer, so you can code on your computer if you so choose to do so. Uh, but... Uh, you know, you, you wanna you wanna make sure you know the stuff by memory because if you if you spend too much time looking for the answers in your books and things like that, you're gonna run out of time. So just because it's open notes doesn't mean like you can just forget about it and just you know I mean take advantage of that. Make a cheat sheet that could be useful. Like a cheat sheet could be useful for things like operator overloading, like for you to remember these kind of things. That could be useful, but it will not be useful for you to just have like your entire stack of notes or the book or something and then just kind of go page by page looking for an answer. That is going to waste you too much time, and then you are going to run out of time in that case. But okay, so this is the first thing in the test is just telling you all this stuff. The second test, the second question is like the same as before, where you pledge to not do anything sketchy, like sharing your answers with other people. You can talk about the test, but wait until the deadline finishes at 2.32 p.m. In fact, 
I think we are the last class. So yeah, as, as, as soon as as soon as like two thirty p two thirty two p.m. hits, then you can talk about the test on Discord if you choose to do so. Uh, okay, so this is how it goes. The first three questions of the test, like real questions, are going to come from the virtual function question pool. And again, I will go over those pools individually in a little bit. But first, I'm going to give you the overview. Okay, so we got three questions from virtuals. One point per question. So they're all actually all the questions except for the last question are worth one point each. So because you see it being 20 points, it means that there is, I suppose, 14 or 15 questions, basically. Okay, because the last question is worth five points. So that means that will be 15. So I guess 16, 16 questions will be the, the total of the test, I guess. So anyway, so those three are from virtuals. The next two questions are going to be from templates. Then three questions are going to be recursion. Then three questions is going to be operator overloading. Then two questions from exception handling. That was the one assignment you guys did. And then two questions from linked lists. And then the big programming question. Let me call it big because it's, it doesn't mean it's like massive. It just means that it's, uh, it's kind of more elaborate. And that one is worth five points. That's how the distribution of the test is. Again, to go over, to repeat that, again, you can rewind too, but I'll repeat it for those watching live. Three on virtual. Two on templates, three on recursion, three on operator overloading, two on exception handling, two on linked list, one on the program. And everything but the program is worth one point. The program itself is worth five points. So because it's worth five points, it's just, you know, if you are running short on time, you want to make sure you get that program done. Do we have to make comments on the last program question? Um, I don't think you do. However, if you don't know how to do a certain part of it, then at least write a comment saying how you should have done it so that you can get partial credit. That's what I would recommend. And then there's a last question of the test that's called the optional file upload. Again, if you decide to do something by hand, then you can upload it this way. Or if you need to upload anything in the questions that don't allow you to upload things. Uh, I think pretty much all the questions here are like, like text submissions, so you can code right in there. But if if you choose to upload like the, the, the big program or something or anything else you want to upload like scrap work or, or if you just decided to do the whole test by hand or something, that's that question. That's what that question is for. It's one upload. If you have multiple files, put them in a zip file or something. So it lets you upload everything. Okay. So that is the test distribution. Now I'm going to go now and tell you what each of the, the topics of the pools are. So I'm going to try to go in the same order. So is, <coughs> the first three questions are from virtuals. Let's go ahead and look at the virtual pool. Can we upload the CCCPP file? For the programming question, you can. Some of the questions that ask for just code, you can do CPP files, but some questions that ask for both code and text. So you could upload a CPP file, but you might as well upload a text file because it'll be easier for the graders. But for the big program, I think a CPP would be okay. The idea being that you want to make it easy for the graders to do their job. So, I mean, they, they will work with you, though. Okay, so I am opening up the virtual pool. The virtual pool is made up, I think, of something like... Each of these pools, again, has anywhere from, like, 20 to 30 questions. I think the smallest one being the accepted handling that has, like, 16 questions. A lot of those questions are repetitive. There's a very small chance that you might get the same question asked by two different people. Like, I maybe I wrote a question about, like, virtuals, like... Like virtual inheritance, you know, maybe I wrote a question on virtual inheritance and somebody else did too. There's a low chance of that, but it's unlikely. Okay, so looking at these questions, again, they were submitted by different uh, instructors, including myself. Although I did, didn't do as many as some other people did, actually, to be fair. But um, yeah, I'm going to kind of just look at them and see if there's anything I want to point out that it's important. So the first question, this has to do with, with abstract classes. It's a true false question, I guess. So there's that. I think it is. Yeah, true false question. Okay. That's kind of easy, but okay. All right. Um, the second question is also about abstract classes, but it's a short answer question. So very basic question about abstract classes. The third question is also about abstract classes, but that one shows you a piece of code and ask you if there's anything wrong with it. And I actually don't know if there's anything wrong with it, just looking at it, but I'm sure if there's something it has to do with virtual since it's virtual related, abstract related. 
The next one is asking you, you're given an abstract class and you want to make it not abstract. So how do you do that? You know, remember how, how to do that is basically, what's an abstract class? Let's make sure we know what that is. Abstract classes are, are, are classes that have some sort of virtual function in them, right? And so you can instantiate an object out of an abstract class. To be able to do that, you need to actually, you know, define the, abs the, the virtual functions to now make it like a normal class. So, you know, if, if they give you an abstract class with a bunch of virtuals, you have to probably either inherit and then define those virtual functions and actually give them a body or just give them a body in the same class. That could actually work too. And then there's questions pretty much about what I was saying. Pretty much seems to be the constant thing about abstract. Oh, here's a question that I wrote. I don't remember what I wrote. Oh yeah, this is a good one. So remember static and dynamic binding and virtual functions and how that plays into effect. That question is related to that. See, yeah, So because I remember emphasizing on that. And I'm actually curious to see if the other classes get it right. Function overriding, you know, make sure you know what that is. Virtual destructors, that's a question that I put in about virtual destructors, so make sure you know what those are and, you know, what do they do, what their purpose is. You know, what a pure virtual function is. Some of these are asking for definitions of like, what is an abstract class? You know, what is a pure abstract class? Uh, copy constructors. To compare function overloading versus function overriding. Virtual destructors. Concept of polymorphism. One of them is just asking you what the output of a program is, but I'm sure there's a trick to it because I could you just copy and paste this into your IDE. So there's probably a trick to it. Questions about virtuals in relation to memory leaks and in relation to destructors. Virtual inheritance, and that's pretty much it. So those are sort of the ongoing topics that the questions are being pulled from. As you can see, you got things from true false. Most of them are short answers. A couple of them are looking at code and understanding it. And in this case, I, I don't see any except for the ones that actually make you like, you know, convert an abstract class to like a, like a normal class. Those are the only ones that I see that involve coding for the virtual function section. So luck of the draw on what question you're gonna get. Okay, so that's the virtuals. Moving on into the template ones. So the template, you are getting two questions out of that. And the reason being is because templates, there's, there's only so much we can ask. Like virtuals, you can ask so much stuff. Like I could have a test of 20 questions of virtuals. No problem whatsoever. We really should. Virtuals was one of the things they wanted us to emphasize anyways. But templates, there's only so much you can do unless you get to really fancy, nasty syntax stuff. So uh, I guess before we be looking at the questions, remember templates, you got two main template types. You got function templates and you got class templates. And they all basically work under the idea that you have a template variable, which can be any type. And that type has to be defined at compile time. And the way you do it is in, in, when you call a function, then you see the parameters, you see what type they are. In the case of a class, you actually have to define when you're creating a class because you typically write something like if the, if the class is called A and you're making an object of that class and that has a template in it, it might be something like an int and then A, right? And so that's when you create a uh, create an object of that template, a class. That's when you're telling it what type is. And again, this happens at compile time, right? So anyways, that's the basic idea behind templates. You got to know some of the, the nits and picks of templates, like like the syntax required. Like you, know, you got to write the word template and then class T or class U or class or type name, whatever. Those are the kind of nits and picks that you got to know, you know, to make sure your code compiles and runs. So going off of that, looking at the questions, they're asking about the usages of templates, uh, what the templates are. That's a basic one. I mean, I just told you what they are. So if you get that one, consider yourself lucky. Um, some of them are asking you to look at some code and write a template function for it. Some of them are asking you to write some class templates based on an example given. Some are asking for some syntax when it, when it comes to inheriting the template. Some are giving you some code 
and then asking you to actually like giving you a templated class and then asking you to instantiate it kind of how I just did right here either dynamic or normal so like this is normal but dynamic would be with the new variable used somewhere asking you to compare function overloading function overriding and templates that's actually a question for me some are asking you how poly polymorphism comes into play and things like compile time versus runtime polymorphism. So like templates is compile time, but virtuals is runtime, that kind of thing. Some are giving you code and then asking you to match, I suppose, definitions of things. Probably like match like this is a class template, this is a function template, that kind of thing. And yeah, that seems to be the recurring type pretty much for the rest of the questions. There's like 16 questions in this group. So yeah, that's templates for you. Moving on to recursion. So for recursion, the best thing I can suggest to you when practicing for the test is to just practice doing recursion. Practice redoing aspects of previous assignments with recursion, practice Fibonacci, practice those kind of things. That's really the recursion. There's no easy like here. This is what you need to know. And now you're you're an expert at this. It's just it's like a sport. You just got to practice it to become good at it. You can you can learn the technique, but you got to practice it. So um, Fibonacci related question I see probably has to do with recursions. Some of them give you code and ask you to correct it. They say there's there's an error in this recursive function, fix it. My guess is something related to like not having a base case, not having a recursive case, or maybe not, you know, having it still going to a finite recursion because the tech code is backwards. That's just, I, don't, I haven't even seen the code that the question's asking for, but this is what I would assume that it would ask for. Uh, what is this one? Oh, interesting. Maybe yeah, maybe these are two terms that I didn't talk about, which I probably should. So when you have a function calling itself, that is also known as direct recursion. It's a, it's a term that people use just to kind of compare it to something known as indirect recursion. Indirect recursion, I did talk about the concept, but I never I don't know if I ever use that term. It's like if I have, at some point I told you like, okay, if foo calls itself, then you know that's infinite recursion, right? Unless you have a base case. This is known as direct recursion. But now suppose that foo calls a function called bar. And then bar is a function that calls foo. So this is like, I, I think I use the term ping pong. Like it basically just goes back and forth, recursing over and over again, but it still goes into infinite recursion. It's just kind of going back and forth. That is also known as indirect recursion. And I don't think it's a term that I use, but know it because it's mentioned in one of the questions of the test. So the question is not asking like what indirect recursion is, but it's asking like, given this example of indirect recursion. So I wanna make sure that you don't get lost with that terminology. Uh, know the main parts of components of recursion, like the whole base, recursive case, that kind of stuff. Head recursion, tail recursion, which I did talk about. Some of them are asking what the output of some code is. Again, probably a trick to it because you could just run the code. Something I didn't do this time around that I've done in the past is usually in my test, I, I make them draw a recursive tree like we did in class. I don't think I gave a question like that because I didn't know if other sections taught how to do recursion trees. So I don't think you will see those. So consider yourself lucky on that because I would have asked it 100% if it was just my test. Some of them are asking you to write recursion functions to do X and Y, you know, whatever X and Y is like, here's an array, print it out recursively, or here's this data structure, do recursively, or, or do this math formula recursively, or take this iterate function and convert it to recursion. There's a lot of those in here. There's a question on palindromes that I added myself related to recursion, which I did show you in class. Hey, there's a question on recursion trees, but it's not asking you to draw in the trees. It's just talking about them. So I'm kind of, I'm really happy about that. 
so yeah that seems to be the ongoing thing like printing things in reverse and whatnot so with that one there's no recurring theme other than just uh kind of you know do it test it move on all right operator overloading so that one can can be a lot of things but at the same time it's 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 really knowing the main two ways of overloading operators which is as a class member function or as a friend function when you need friend functions is when you have to access privates from two separate classes if, if, you, if it's all related to one class and you can just make it a member function and have access to privates there are other ways around this I mean I showed you how to hack into private variables so you don't really need ever friend functions but to make it a nice clean code you should put a friend function in some of the operators that you have to overload with friend functions are things like C in and C out. So insertion, stream insertion and stream exact extraction operator. Because they deal with two separate classes, they deal with the, the uh, stream insertion or extraction operator classes, like the, you know, the less than less than sign you know, or greater greater than sign. And then the other part of it is the object that you're trying to print or read into, right? And so if you, if you look at a binary operator, when you're looking at a binary operator, you got the left hand side operand, then you got the operator, and then you got the right hand right hand side operand. This one, if you have access to this class, to the left hand side class, you can make it a member function there. Then you have access to the left hand side as a private variable. And then the right hand side, this one is the one you gotta make a friend function of, or vice versa. However, you could also just make it a friend function of both classes and then um, basically have access to it. So, yeah. I don't think there's any, any uh, operators that you have to do like uh, as a member function. I can't think. Maybe like the unary operators. I'm not sure. But anyways, based on the questions they ask you, Hey, it's a vector class. That's cool. I wonder if it's like my vector class. So someone, I guess, is just asking you to look at some code. Some of them are asking you to implement like a like a certain operator: stream insertion, stream extraction, addition, subtraction, multiplication. Some of the basic operators, basically, like they give you some code of a class and then say overload this operator so it does that. And so you have to write a function for it. And they tell you, like, make a friend function or make a member function. They don't leave it up to you to decide. You have some conceptual questions, like scenarios on when you want to choose one over the other type, which I kind of just talked about. Uh, they do ask some of the special cases, like operators that cannot be overloaded, or some of the special rules, which I did talk about at some point with operator overloading. Like, you can't change order precedence, that kind of thing. Some of them are asking things like the disk pointers, what they are, uh, how, why it's useful. That's kind of unrelated to operator overloading, so I don't know why it's here, but it is. Uh, it seems to be an ongoing consensus about people asking which operators you cannot overload. So just remember those. Like, for example, the ternary operator you cannot overload. That's the one with a little question mark in the colon. So it's very possible that you could get the same two questions asked by two different people twice. It's unlikely, but it's possible. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Most of these are just asking you to overload an operator based on some code. Yes, that would be sad because if you don't know the answer to a question, then you're kind of screwed at that point because you got asked it twice. That's when you should start sweating and being like, oh no, I should have prepared. All right, exception handling. So that's the top, the least covered topic for this class that we kind of just kind of briefed over. And then you kind of did an assignment and it wasn't worth a lot, but it is going to show up on the test. And some of the questions are asking like what the output of some code is. Hope you get that one, but uh,
most of them are basically knowing if you know the logic between try and catch. So if you hit an exception on a try block, then you catch it on the catch side of the block, right? But depending on the parameter of the catch, so like when you have something like this, this is worth going over since we kind of just went really fast with that stuff. So you got your try block and you got your catch block. Now this, by the way, is the catch all. So that will catch any ex exceptions that are raised in the try block. So if you see something like that, then it'll catch whatever here. However, what you could also see is like a special catch. So maybe this catches an integer exception. And then beneath it, you could have like a catch for like a uh, exception class. And then maybe you have a catch for a float. Float M. Maybe it should be float F, but whatever. And then at the bottom, you might have an actual catch all. So like it catches any remainder exceptions. So if in your try block, you get a special exception that is like an integer, then this code, this code runs. It catches it and it runs that. And it skips this, this, and this, unless other exceptions were to be yet to be catched. Caught, not catched. If this raises an exception class, exception, I suppose, then this doesn't run because it's not an integer exception, but this one runs and it catches it. So it, it depends on what exception is generated. Now, if an exception is generated in a class, it remembers that so when it comes out of the class or sorry not class sorry when an exception gets generated inside a function so like let's say this is in foo and then foo was called by main like blah 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 code 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 foo code 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 if an exception is thrown here it remembers it so when it runs from foo it can actually be caught after the function this is very useful when i'm actually using uh libraries that are like by other people i can catch exceptions that those libraries come out with that could be useful for me to like, you know, catch potential errors that my code generated on their code, or sorry, my data generated on their library. So basically what they do here is they, they, they throw a special type of exception and then depending on the type, you gotta figure out where it's caught. Some of them are asking you to make your own exception classes. Some of them have special kinds of exceptions like divisions by zero or bad memory allocation like you had in that assignment when you have to do that like massive like integer two billion array or something. You know, that'll give that bad alloc exception. That's kind of the stuff that you will see, but nothing beyond that really. Some are just asking basic syntax rules of this, like, you know, the try catch block and whatnot. Yeah, that's pretty much it. A lot of these are the same questions, to be honest, in different ways. But yeah, and most of them are just like, here's some code. What happens when an exception is thrown? Or here's some code. What kind of exception will be thrown? Or here's some code. Write the catch block for it. Or write the actual try catch block entirely. Those kind of things. Finally, we get the link list stuff. For the link list stuff, there's a matching questions. There's a... So for the linked list, what you should really know is singly linked list, which is what we've been talking about so far. Know the concept of a node, which is made up of your data component and your link component, also called the next pointer. So, you know, you got yourself a node is made up of your data and your link, which is a pointer that is initialized to null usually. So if you get a question on things like doubly linked list or something, then, uh, then let me know and you will not be marked off for that. Most of them are asking things like why use a linked list over an array, like the conceptual questions. Some of them are asking you to do a specific operation on linked list, like the ones that we've covered so far. Is there any coding on linked list? I don't think so. Oh, here's one of them. One of them is asking you to write a print function for the linked list, I think. So you might see that. 
Most of them are asking you to list things like steps to do stuff rather than writing code. You will see the code when it comes to the final exam. That's when it'll really focus. But we wanted to keep it light on the linked list material. One of them is asking you to write two lines of code related to deleting stuff. But it explains what, because as you know, we haven't talked too much about deleting. Although I did show you how to deallocate a link, <coughs> a link list, like that was the last sec last thing we did. So you could look at that as review as well. Some of them are asking you to do like inserts to your link list, like actually write some code for that, but not like they're asking you for one of the four. Remember, you can insert at the beginning of a link list. You can insert at the end of a link list. You can also insert at the middle of the link list. And then you can also insert to an empty link list. So those are potentially four different scenarios. They might ask you to do one of them. And they're not going to ask you to do the one in the middle because that's a hard one usually. But they might ask you like, like a pen at the end of the link list and so, and so on. And yeah, that's pretty much it. But if you do get a question that you think you, we haven't covered or something, just do your best and then write a comment on the question and then let me know. And then, you know, if, if, it, if it comes to that, then we'll just not count that question. So if you do get a question like that. But pretty much you should know most of these. And finally, the program. So there's three programs that you can get out of. So that one is not that random. You're going to get one of these three. Uh, I wrote one of them. And I guess Sam wrote the other two. So uh, one of them is operator overloading related. The other one is template related. And the other one is template related, but with a linked list twist to it. Whereas the other one is like more like the vector class, I think. So it's luck of the draw which one you get it's not a lot of code but it is definitely more elaborate so like the other questions you'll be able to do in like one minute each at the top you know assuming you know the answer this one it might take you like a, like maybe 10 minutes to do or something you know to be safe i would say 10 minutes but yeah that's pretty much the the questions of the test so Moving on, I suppose now I will open the floor to specific things that you guys have questions of. And if not, then I will do the three one three topics that people already asked me beforehand. But we have basically 45 minutes, 42 minutes of time. So ask away. And if not, then I'll do the ones that already have been asked. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions, so I guess I'll 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 do that. I'll do the. Uh, oh, here we go. Okay, could we see a coding example of a linked list? Well, you can. That's the one that we were doing last time, so I could show you that again. I do have it open. What is the difference between return this and return this? Here, I'll answer that really fast because we can get that out of the way. So, the this pointer is a reference to yourself. And what that means is that when you're working with a class function, so we have a class A, and inside of that class, you have a function foo and maybe you also have an integer x in it when you're at, when you're writing in your function something like c out this x what this is referring to is your class variable now normally you can just say c out x but sometimes you prefer to do that because internally it is being appended automatically so then you would just be doing it explicitly by putting that what the this pointer is is somewhere in memory, and if we look at you know our memory, somewhere in here at some address, let's just say this is the address, we have 
are class variables, which in this case, let's, let's add one more to it, int x and int y. X is the first variable that we see in the class, so that's going to be at address 0. And then the next address, which would be address 1, which is shifted by 4, is where y is, right? What the this pointer contains is the address of the first class variable. So that would be address 100. So when it sees this y, it kind of works like an array indexing, indexing system. It basically takes the address 100 and thus pointer arithmetic by adding 1, which of course in pointer arithmetic is the equivalent of adding 4 because it's an integer addition. And so that is how you get y. So the this pointer is just re re returning an address to the object, wherever it is allocated in memory. It would also return to you if, if we were um, if we were calling like new, you know, we're making an object of new a like that, then this address would be the equivalent of the address that you would get back if you said, you know, ampersand this, and then like see out that. Actually, no, just see out, just see out this. You don't even need the ampersand, okay? So now that I know, now that we know what this is, let's talk about when you see you return this and return asterisk this. Let me make some space because I guess I had the the next heading for the for the next last two earlier on. Okay, let's move on. As you can see, next class we'll talk about linked list. More about it. Anyways, so when you see a function return this. What it's returning is typically the object itself. So it might be a function that returns a, that, that is returning an object. And so it's actually making a copy of the object, and that's why it's dereferencing first. When you see a function say return this without the asterisk, it's just returning, a, returning an address, which is kind of like a shallow copy versus like a deep copy. In practice, when you're looking at return this is like in a copy constructor or an assignment operator that is where you want to return this actually i would say not 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 as much copy constructor as assignment operator assignment operator yes because an assignment operator you might have something like this and so you want to be able to 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 assign this to to assign c to b but then return it so that it can also be assigned to a and so you typically see this as the bottom line of your assignment operator overloading. So, um, yes. Do you see it with the copy constructor? You do see it as well with the copy constructor. You do. Because you might have a line of code that says like this. Suppose you have the following code. Even though this looks like assignment operator, this actually is running the copy constructor. And we actually run into this in the lecture. And we were like, oh, cool, it's actually calling the copy constructor. So, so yes, you will see it as well in copy constructor, okay? So hopefully that kind of answers that. Now, as for the example of the linked list, this is the code that we did last class with the linked list. So you can go ahead and look at the last video to see how we made up this code. And I think actually it was, a, it was two classes that we did this. And so um, that's your best bet for like an example. And this has been posted on Canvas already. So you can go, you can go download a copy and have it for reference when you're doing the test. But um, I don't, I don't really know what to show you from here. Um, I guess I should emphasize the deallocation stuff since I did do that, do that like last second, last class. So you just do a while loop, and then again, you always. This is your the example that I gave you last time was a construction of a bridge, and this is your road close sign that you have a null pointer. That's your road close sign. So what you're saying is, while you haven't seen that road close sign, keep driving down the highway. So while well, head is not equal to null, and then what you do is you make a copy of the current pointer, and then from there, oh, it's like a flicker. You make a copy of the current pointer, and then from there you update the pointer to the next node by saying head equals head next, and then you delete that copy of the pointer that is still pointing to the previous node to deallocate it. And so doing that, we'll go ahead and deallocate slash delete your linked list. So that is useful to know as well, okay? Mm. All right, so I don't know if there's anything specific that you want me to do for the for this. But like I said, if you want to see how this was developed, just watch the last lecture. And we will continue working on this. And we only have seen singly linked lists, but just so you know, 
what we have in case in case it gets mentioned, but I don't think it will in the test. A doubly linked list is the same thing as a singly linked list, but you have a next pointer, which is pointing to the next node, and you have a previous pointer that points to the previous node. And it can be useful to go in both directions of a linked list instead of going in one direction. But like I said, we haven't really gone over that. That will be the, the focus of next week's lecture. Probably the, the, the Wednesday one because, or actually, well, no, we have class on Wednesday. So Wednesday we might see it, we might not, because we still got to do some things to this first, but we might see it at some point for sure. Uh, okay, so I don't see anything else. So in the meantime, while you guys think of stuff, I'll go over the questions that people had ahead of time. So somebody wanted to see an example of a friend function. So let's just do that real fast. Let's just come up with a class. We'll call this class uh, money class. And this class has a function of, has two variables in it. Dollars and pennies. I don't know how to is, is plural pennies like that. I think it is. So we'll do we'll do just go with that. Um, okay, hmm, that's a risky word to be typing if you make a typo. But okay, so um, let's say that we want to make a function that can add two monies together. I guess we'll call them uh, instead of money. No, yeah, money's okay. And maybe we also want a print function for it. But the print function, we're just going to, we're not going to overload too much, too much effort. We'll overload the addition. But we'll make it private. Yeah, we'll make it private so that you can see why a friend function would be useful. So print is just going to print out the dollars and then the little dot and then the pennies. And then we'll make a constructor so that we can set it to some values. So we'll say like uh, uh, int v, int p, and then dollars gets d, and then pennies gets p. And that's it. Okay. So I'll just go ahead and make two two of these. So we'll call it like. We'll call it money, you know, C1, change one and change two. And we're going to set this is going to be like a dollar fifty. And then this is going to be um, two dollars and twenty five cents, I guess. Thirty five cents. Okay, why not? All right. So before we do anything, let me make sure it compiles. See if I'm missing anything obvious. Uh, it's private. Oh, no, that should be okay then, even if it is private. Because it's a member function. Oh, well, this one has to be public though. Ah, no, 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 I know what I screwed up. I need to write the word public here. There we go. Okay. All right. So now let us go ahead and uh, make a third money C3 that is equal to C1 plus C2. But before we do that, actually, let's just test the print function. So let's just try to print out one of these print C2. Or actually, c2 dot print like that. So as you can see, the print function works. It's just that printing out. I mean, we, we can make it cooler by adding a little dollar sign. But okay. So now the issue is that we want this to be c3 dot print, right? Because we want to be able to make the addition and then actually be able to print it. Of course, if we try to compile it now, we get an error on the uh, addition part 
it says that there is no match for operator plus. So what we need to do is we need to overload operator plus. So we could do it as a member function, but I'm going to do it as a friend function because that's what you guys want to show you. So it'll be a public function that is going to be called operator plus. And uh, the, 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 the arguments are the left-hand side and the right-hand side. So in this case, both of those are of the money class. So we'll call it money left and money right. And so what we want to do is we want to make a third. So we're going to call it money answer. And we'll, once we make that, we want to basically uh, fill it up with the right values, right? So in the constructor, what we're going to do here is to make the left hand side is we are going to take the left money's dollars and add that to the right money's dollars and of course we got to tweak this if we go over 100 because it's, it's not overflowing correctly but we'll, we'll, no, we'll do that later if we have time and over here we want to overload the cents so we can do something like left dot pennies plus right dot pennies like that and then we can just go ahead and say return answer okay however this will not compile right now because these are private variables so this is where we need this to be a friend function so that it can compile so the way we make it a friend function is we take the function sort of declaration and then just throw it in here it doesn't matter if it's public or private we figure that out and then just write the word friend there so we're basically adding it to the friends to the friends uh, list of the money class we're saying it's a friend it's okay he has access to your privates and then uh, it should work i mean but it didn't let's see uh return statement with a value and function oh we forgot to make this it's not void actually yeah 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 it should be um money it returns money Oh, well, now we got updated here as well, because now it's not a friend with the It's like friends with the with the brother versus like the actual function or something. Okay, there we go. So, good catch on that. So, now, as we can see, we do indeed get 385, which is the correct result from this addition. The problem right now with this function, I suppose, not problem, but if like if this was 285 here, then we are going to get like a weird number here, 3135. We're not overflowing correctly. We could fix that by making the code fancy here. We could like uh, we could we could say like uh, int d equals, and then take all of this, put it here, and then do like int p equals this, uh, there we go. And then what we, what we can do is we can say something like if p is greater than 100, then d plus equals 1. So we add 1 to, 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 um, to the dollars and then take p minus 100. p minus equal 100. And then... Uh, that should solve the overflow problem. There we go. Is that correct? Let's see. Four. And then, yeah, that is indeed correct. So that works. And then if we bring it back to how we had it before. Then this works fine. And the, the edge case scenario, I suppose. If you're unit testing, this is what you would want to unit test. Would be 498. So that works as well. Right? Yeah. Seems right. So, anyways, but I mean, you know, the the point of this is the fact that it's a friend function. So uh if you if you wanted to make it some member function, you could. Let's just really fast make this abstraction. When use this against c1 dot add money c2, uh, well, 
You could do it as a member function, which is kind of what you're saying. So what I could also do to this function is I could make it something like this. Let's do, let's do the subtraction for that. So let's just say we want money operator minus, and here we just need one parameter, which is the right-hand side. And then in this case here, what we want to do, first of all, pass it by reference. We should really just pass all these by reference to make it more efficient. But uh, yeah, is we can say something like this dollars minus, and you don't need to this part, but I'm using it because that was asked earlier, versus the right dollars um, minus equals. And then pennies minus equals right dot pennies. Oh wait, 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 wait. I'm I'm, I'm I don't want to override it. No, I don't want to override it. So let's make a temporary variable. Int d and then int p pennies minus pennies. And then I can just copy and paste that same thing from this one which by the way I could probably nah, nah I don't want to confuse you so yeah we'll leave it like this and then um, this of course will also have issues if we go into the negatives so um, you know <laughs> I'd have to do something like a P is a negative number so if p is less than zero then i can say dollar minus equal one so subtract one from dollar or here just d minus minus i suppose and then p minus equals a hundred or actually plus add a hundred to it i think that'll work for uh, the logic behind negative, so if we say something like 10 pennies minus 11 pennies, we don't want to have negative one pennies. We want to have 99 pennies, but a dollar less, right? So I think that'll work like that. We'll see. So if we say something like see you, um, money C4 equals C1 minus C2, C4 print, Negative a dollar fifteen. Is that correct? One minus that would be. No, that doesn't seem right. It should be like negative eighty-five. We screwed up the math, but the logic worked. As in, like it actually overloaded the operator as a member function. But uh, that does not seem right. It should be negative eighty-five cents. Right, because the dollar fifty minus two eighty five would be a remainder of eighty five cents. So we're taking this part minus this part. So one minus two should be negative one. I don't know. That is, it hurts my brain to think about that. But we, you know, the math, the math is messed up. But if we, uh, if we get rid of this and we just ignore that, you know, this is, this is, this is okay. Cause it's the same 50 minus 85 is 15, but it should be negative 15 right there. I don't know, I have to like think as to the why we're getting that value of 15. Oh, wait, 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 no. But because 15 minus 35 is 15, so that is actually correct. Maybe I'm just not doing basic math. Let's see, 1.50 minus 2.35. No, that's 85 cents, that is 85 cents. So why?
Okay. Yeah, something to do with the carry. So, I think... These should be set to zero. Well, no, no, the, the, the issue has to do with the carry, but if I set it to zero, it'll work here, but it won't work for other scenarios. So I think the easiest thing to do here to like not hurt my brand if I wanted to do it is I can just convert everything to like hundreds and then just, uh, just call it a day on that basically. So like, you know, I could say something like this. So int answer starts out with zero and then put a loop for int i is equal to zero, i is less than d, i plus plus. And then every time there's a d, I'm gonna take my answer and I'm going to add a hundred to that. And once that is done, then I'm gonna just go ahead and say answer equals answer plus pennies. Okay. And I'm gonna do that for both of them, for the left and for the right. So we're gonna call this, actually we're gonna call this not answer but left. I'm just converting everything to hundreds. Then I can just do like a basic mass abstraction and then convert it back to pennies. And then I'm gonna do this the exact same thing. But uh, with the other ones. Oh no, hold on, I'm I'm doing this in the wrong function. Undo this. Okay, over here is where I wanted to do it. So what I could do if I really wanted to is I can, I can basically, I'm gonna convert this to, to like hundreds and then I'll do the subtraction and then I'll switch it back to, 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 dot, to money because there's probably a better way but it would involve thinking. Um, so like basically we'll call it int left is going to get the pennies and right is going to get the pennies of the right and then we're going to have a for loop for int i is equal to zero i is less than and then in this case is the number of dollars that we have so this would be dollars i plus plus and then we have the same for loop for the other side but this one is on the right side. So we have to write dot dollars. We have left plus equals 100. And then right plus equals 100. And so now we basically have the left and the right as, as actual money or actual hundreds. So then what we can say is we can say left minus right and store that in answer. So now we got the answer, now we gotta convert it back to, to dollars and pennies. So um, the best way to do that is to subtract 100 from each of them until there's less than 100. So we can say while answer is greater than a hundred we can say answer gets reduced a hundred from it and then we heap, we're gonna have our dollar variable start at zero and we're gonna say d plus plus and when we do that then our pennies is merely going to be what's left in answer like that okay so this is all okay, except we're gonna say, we'll change the variable to this, so we don't have naming conventions to real answer. 
Okay, so int right shadows parameter. Int right equals right pennies. Oh, okay, uh, we'll call it right capital right. The issue is the naming convention. It's complaining. Okay, request remember dollars and right, which is of non-class type int. Write dollars. Oh, well, this one we actually want to keep lowercase. And then finally, line 24. Right here. Okay. So there we go. It, it, it almost got it working except for the, for the minus symbol, which I, I hadn't thought about. The minus symbol can be quite a bit of an issue there, but whatever. That can be something we could modify in the print function. So uh, we could say something like if pennies is less than zero, else this. So if, oops. Then we see out a negative symbol there, and we cancel out the pennies. And we kind of we we, the, the, we only have to worry about the pennies for doing that. Um, although in this scenario here, if the dollars is negative two, we're gonna have two negative symbols, which is weird, but whatever. So there we go. So yeah, let me fix it. So now what did I do? What I did was simple, and yet cool. I took the dollars, and because I didn't want to have to think about carries and whatnot. I just converted them to, to actual normal numbers. So like I said, $1.85 is the same thing as $185. So that's basically what I did. I, I just, I just, uh, I did a little loop so that every time that it was a bigger number than 100, I kept track of how many dollars and added 100 to that. And then added the pennies, which is obviously less than 100. And then once I had it as 200 numbers, then I just did a normal subtraction. And then now I have to undo what I did, which is bring it back to the other system, which is reduce 100 from it every time until there's less than 100, at which point the leftover are pennies. So overkill, but at least I know this method works versus having to do a more elegant method, but harder to think about, which would be using carriers and whatnot, which is kind of what you guys did when you were doing your big numb thing. So you guys are probably better at that than I am right now. But anyways, we got it working, so that's cool. So uh, anyways, the other thing that people wanted me to show them was virtuals. So um, I mean, that's kind of a hard one because I mean, there's so much to know about virtuals that I don't really know what you want to see. But um, I'll give you the basic example of it. There is an abstract class. It's abstract because we have a function foo, and that function foo is just a virtual. There's no body to the function. So then if I inherit that class, we'll say class x inherits publicly. Well, actually, we want to make this public. Otherwise, things will be nasty. Uh, public a, or sorry, abstract. then we can go ahead and actually define the function here by saying uh, hello world or something. And so now we have a virtual function, which makes this an abstract class. And then we have a normal class because now we took it, inherited an abstract class, but we defined the function that was virtual, that was a pure virtual. Uh, I do need to add equal zero that'll make it pure. So there we go. So right now, if I go into my main and just randomly throw in a class abstract, you will see that this will not compile. It will tell me that cannot declare variable AB to be of abstract class because of the following fewer virtual function virtual functions are pure and it shows me that however if i try to make it out of class x as you can see 
it compiles and runs fine because I have already defined the function and I can even go ahead and say something like x1.foo and this should print that at the end. Well, it's private. I need to write the word public. But it should print out hello world. So there we go. There's a lot more to virtuals, of course, but I don't think I have time to really go over that. So my recommendation for that is to just go watch the virtual videos if you want to know more, unless you have a specific question on a specific instance of virtuals that, uh, I mean, no things like the diamond problem, that's useful to know as well. Virtual inheritance, virtual destructors, those are special cases, but in general, virtuals are very, very cool because they're runtime binding versus compile time binding, which is everything else. So they allow you to do a lot of cool things. And they allow you to fix a lot of issues, like the wrong destructor being called and things like that. Why does the zero make it pure? Somebody chose at some point when they made the language to do this syntax. They just chose it to be that way. Uh, what it means is that you cannot have a class that has a pure virtual function in it. If you don't have this equals zero, and again, this is just so somebody decided to make this a syntax. That's like a like a why they chose to make you know, like the why they chose to use the word main in, in C++ versus like potato, you know, that's that's kind of like why they chose, they just chose it because they did. So they chose the equal zero part because they did. But uh, if you were to just write it like this, it's a virtual function and it, it, but it doesn't, it's not necessarily a pure one because now if I leave it like that, I do believe that I can actually declare I can declare a class. As long as I don't actually call the pure virtual function, I can declare the class. Oh, I get some nasty error. Uh, okay, but maybe not. Maybe, maybe it complains about that. I thought you could. But as you can see, it's a far nastier error than, um, than if I just make it equal to zero. So, on define reference to vtable. Okay, I actually thought it would let me compile. I prefer to get this error. It's far nicer looking than that one. But at the end of the day, the, the reason being is that there's no body to the function. So it wants a body to the function because if somebody calls that function, it needs to know what code to run. So that's the whole thing with virtuals is that it's like deferring it to runtime to associate them, right? Because if you have two classes, you know, you have to think about like up and down casting stuff, right? So the whole issue with up and down casting is that you might fool the compiler into thinking that a class is its parent or, or a child, and it might call the wrong function or the wrong methods because of it. So virtual ensures that doesn't happen. That's a big powerful thing about virtuals. What is happening here, it's like it's just completely confused and lost, so yeah. So uh, the last thing was linked list related, but we already kind of talked about linked list. So anything else? We still got five minutes basically. And I will make this available as well along. I'll just upload it to that repository that I have. Does it compile to this now? Let me take this off so it compiles. Yep, compiles. So I shall wait for the next few minutes and see if anybody's got a question. If not, then that's pretty much it. Like I said, today is just a review day. So while you guys have any questions, I will go ahead and uh, upload. Press. Okay, logging in. Yes, no problem. My pleasure. Hopefully, it was of some use to you guys to be able to uh, prepare for the test. At the end of the day, I think the test is pretty fair, so I think you guys will do fine, especially if you've been watching the lectures. Okay, it's been updated, so.
you can download it immediately. And I guess it's, it's a good time to remind you that I do always upload the uh, the codes every Wednesday. I do it, but today I, I know since we have the test, it's kind of important to get it now. But it's always uploaded on Canvas. It's the same link every time, so you, you won't see a difference. But it's just the link, the, the file itself is updated. So I'm closing the wrong tab. I had a lot of leftover water, so I'm finishing them all. That's good, because I'm glad, because I was worried, like, no one, because I have no way of tracking, like, download, downloads of them, so. Okay, I finished all of my leftover waters. It's, I was trying to do it, because tonight is the, the day that the recycle truck comes. They come Monday nights. No, not Monday nights, Tuesday mornings. So I want to make sure I, like, got all my plastic out of the way. Okay, well then, if there's nothing else, then that's it. Yeah, I wish mine would come on like Friday, cause like, uh, what? Well, I don't know. It works now, cause I'm home. But normally, if I'm at school, I have to like leave the trash cans out all day, and then that's like a sign that no one's home, kind of thing. Whereas like Fridays, I'm not usually at school. Or if it came like on the weekend, that'd be even better, cause like then I'll for sure be home to take the minute out. But it doesn't matter now because we're just home 24-7. Makes you wonder like if the trash people that separate trash, like if they have to like be scared about like COVID in the trash and things like that. Scary. Okay then, well, I see nothing coming my way. So I should let you go. You guys have a lot of things on your mind right now probably to do with the test, so. Good luck in the test. I'll be available here on the, on the on Discord or Canvas, email, whatever, if you guys have any follow-up questions. Um, if you have any problems in the test, then let me know. Right now, my 302 is taking a test, so I'll be focused on them, but they'll be finished by 4. So, yes. All right. I'll see you guys later in the week on Wednesday so I can hear how you guys are on the test. But, yes, good luck in the test, everybody. Take care. Stay safe. And don't stress out of that. Take it easy.